Welcome to another episode of live Q&A, this time with Jerry Green. My name is Dan Diaz. I am your host. It is an absolute pleasure to have you here. As some of you are already aware, we use StreamYard, a special service to go ahead and broadcast this for you guys. So we want to hear from you. We want to hear your comments and your questions. However, it is important that you give StreamYard permission to share your identity. That way we know exactly who you are. With that in mind, we have a very special episode today. Jerry Green is here with us, and this is really a man that requires no introduction. If you don't know him, he started from absolutely nothing and has gone all the way down to transact over 2,500 transactions over the last few years. And we're not talking about contract assignments only. We're talking about deals that he took down. He went ahead and did something with it, whether they were rehabbed or he went ahead and flipped them and turned them back in the market. So this is an episode that you guys absolutely want to be a part of. But guys, let me just go ahead and bring to the stream Jerry Green himself. Thank you so much for being with us. Please tell us a little bit more about you. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Dan. I appreciate that, man. I am excited to be on here today. And uh, yeah, um, it's... Um, well, uh, I'll start off. I'm located here in uh, Dayton, Ohio area. I live here with my wife and I've got uh, four kids still at home. Now they're getting a little older, but uh, yeah, it's, um, it, you know, I've been doing this business a long time. So kind of give you a little bit of background, Dan, on things. I, uh, you know, I started in this business back in 1994, Dan. So that was my wow. first year in the business. You know, it's kind of a lot of people say, well, how did you get started in this? And at least tell us. Yeah. You know, I'll tell you, it's, it's kind of funny the way I got started on things was I was actually working in the electrical contracting business with my father over in Springfield, Ohio at that time, but before 1994. And I had a business set up where we done a lot of work for general contractors. So never forget one of the nights uh this is like a sunday night and you gotta remember back then wasn't like we had cell phones all the time and we didn't have where we could just jump on the internet stuff like that so i remember i got a phone call at my uh house and then this is all the old wall phones dan okay the, the one that has something stuck to them like <laughs> yeah. a string and, and yeah, they were somehow yeah, plugged yeah. to the yeah, wall the cord that we go you know, a mile out. And then if you were lucky, it was, it was curly, you know, so it, it, <laughs> it would work. Yeah. So it looked like a large curly fry. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I had this phone call come in and it was on a Sunday night and it was a gentleman that was calling me up that actually owned one of the general contracting firms that we'd done a lot of work for as a subcontractor. And he let me know. He said, Hey, Jerry, he says, I just want to contact you. I'm going to give you advance notice. Uh, and I remember advance notice that we're closing our doors to our business as of tomorrow morning. Oh, and no. uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to pay you. And we had a very small business, my my father and I, and um, it was a pretty big hit. It was over 60,000 back in the mid 90s. So that was that was huge. And this was probably around 90, I think it's exactly about 93, something like that. Around okay. Christmas. So I'm like, oh, no, what am I going to do? Well, fast forward a little bit that my father and I, we could not get out of that side of things. We took a big hit and I ended up going bankrupt because of that. And I was like, wow. okay, what am I going to do? So then I was, you know, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. While, while I was trying to figure that all out, I saw this advertisement and um, actually on the local TV station about an upcoming real estate seminar in Cincinnati. Ohio. Was it at two o'clock in the morning? <laughs> It, it probably was, Dan, because, you know, I was like trying to figure out what I'm going to do. Am I going to get a job? What, you know, what, what's going to happen? So I saw this advertisement. It was a gentleman that uh, he, he since then he's passed away. But a gentleman uh, that was running this um, seminar uh, company back then, it was um, his name was Charles Gibbons. It was okay. a Gibbons organization. Very few okay. people I talk to today say, oh, yeah, I've yeah. heard of him, but it, not a whole lot of them have. You know, he, yeah. he's been he was one of the original granddaddies in the whole wow. space here. So I went to that seminar and I basically sat there for three days in Cincinnati and thinking, wow, this is kind of cool. I think I can make this happen. And one of the things that really stuck out to me was the ability to do wholesaling. Now, you got to remember back in the 90s. 
wholesaling was something like, what is that? It was like yeah. a, a foreign thing. Okay. Yeah. So I actually said, I'm did they gonna... actually, did he call it wholesaling or did he call it contract assignments? Well, they, a lot of that back then was typically more in the areas of assignments. Yeah. And then the wholesaling side of things kind of came in more with a lot of talk from like Ron the Grand and stuff yeah. like that. So, but yeah, that's how I kind of got started in that. And it was interesting on that because I ended up hiring a mentor from that event. The only problem is I had no way to pay him. So I ended up going my mom and dad and I ended up borrowing credit cards from them to be able to pay him. And that's how I got started in this whole thing. And the thing is, Dan, I had, you know, all your, anybody that's on here today or that's watching later, you know, I had, I had something that we're all familiar with called monthly bills, right? Yes. Yeah. And I had to take care of those obligations. So I had to focus on um, really what I call, you know, uh, I always refer to it as chunk money, money coming in way of chunks. Yep. And that came through basically doing the wholesale method of things. Mm -hmm. And when I started, you know, there, remember, there was no list mm -hmm. providers. There was everything was, you know, any list I created, it was on my own. So I went out beating the streets. I remember yeah. going out, taking boards off windows, crawling in through uh, those windows there, getting in the properties, whatever I uh, uh, could do. I was out hustling all the time. So you were talking to neighbors. You were doing detective work. Oh, yeah. 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 It was <laughs> big time. And that's what I started doing. And then yeah. I built that up, started doing deals and started continuing to build that up. And next thing you know, I started creating a consistent flow of deals coming in. And I said, you know, I started really getting some traction. Then I realized I said, hey, you know what? I can go into the fix and flip model. So I decided why not move into that? So we started doing that side of things. And I think I was drawn to that more, too, from just my construction background. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I started getting into the fix and flip model. And that was going now into... Now, what my, years are we talking about here? Well, I'm pushing into the year about 2000 now. So about, Got it. Okay. about a four or five year period. Uh, about Well, about six years, really, total there. It was late 90s. Um, we were rocking and rolling pretty heavy on things. I was actually written up in the local paper in Springfield. Oh. It was just, you know. It, Why you know, that is that was, not like printed and on your wall right now? That would be so cool. <laughs> Dude, I, I, Dan, I'm trying, you know, I, I had to go back and try to find that somewhere, but it's buried in a box somewhere. Oh, so, no, no. Yeah. I, I love, I love your, your, your wall decor because it moves us. But man, I would put, I would frame that. <laughs> and that news article, oh man, that that'd be great, and not because of the fame. And I think you'll agree yeah, with yeah, me. It's yeah, not yeah, that. It's like I got recognized for impacting the community. Yeah, you it know, was cool. Really cool. It, it was cool, and it, um, you know, and then as the year two thousand rolled into place, I was looking. You know, it was my wife and I were working the business. We we're working out of our home, and you, you know, we were hustling along pretty good. We have some people just kind of helping us out a little bit. It was no, you know, just part time type people, really, just you know pay them as we go type thing. And <clears throat> so we were making it happen. And then, uh, you know, then what big, big thing we did was my wife and I were like, wow, we really changed things. We're bankruptcy to the point now where we're chugging along and we were in a position where we could actually build a home from, so bankruptcy mm -hmm. to that point where we could build a home. And so we decided to build a home. We built our new home. We were excited about it. We moved into it. And then we found out uh, right after that, that my wife was uh, pregnant. We were going to have our first child and we were just pumped. Oh, and, uh, congrats. And then we went into, and then uh, later that year, uh, my wife started having some complications mm. and the pregnancy. And, um, you know, I went into a position where we thought, wow, what, what's going on? So we, we went into the hospital several times for just, you know, checking in on things. And then the final time they, they, went ahead and met her during this, say, Hey, we got to induce labor. And uh, so my baby boy was born like a little over two months early. Oh and no! The day he was born though, I remember the doctor saying this, I think your boy's going to be fine. He said, but I'm concerned about your wife. Mm. And so they immediately took my wife down for a CT scan right after my son was born. And within about two hours, they came back. And let us know that the concern they had with my wife was that they just found a massive tumor in her kidneys. 
Hmm. And about two hours of my son being born. Wow. Wow. That must have been uh, very oh, challenging. I mean, the joy of your boy. Yeah. And then your wife. It was un unbelievable, Dan. It was like you're, you're up here and then all of a sudden in a, you yeah. don't even know where to go. Two minutes later. Yeah. And this was over in, in Springfield, Ohio. And oh, man. So very quickly, in a matter of days, she had to go to, to a hospital over in Columbus called the James Cancer Institute to get find out what it was. And probably about a week later, we found out it was a cancerous tumor. Mm -hmm. And it's called Wilms tumor, which is very rare for an adult to have, but it's a kidney cancer, but mainly found in kids. Um, in you know, kind of but this time forward. it was on your wife. Yeah, it was on my wife. Yeah. And then Dan, uh, in a very short period of time, she went in for a major surgery to remove the tumor. And we thought it'd be, uh, you know, like a, the doctor thought maybe a three to four hour surgery. And she was in yeah. surgery for 14 hours. Oh, no. And this was over in Columbus. And, you know, I still remember the doctor coming out and telling us that he wasn't able to save the kidneys at all. Had to completely remove her kidneys. And uh, instantly at that moment in time, she was completely dependent on dialysis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then after that, Dan, we, you know, we were hoping they'd be able to get her home within, uh, you know, three or four weeks. And then literally one complication set in after another. And they actually took care of her at a children's hospital in Columbus. That was actually the children's hospital in Columbus, Ohio, because it's a childhood cancer. But she uh, very rarely do, they'll do this. And then they actually put a adult patients in a, uh, in a children's hospital because of the rarity of the disease. Yeah. And we ended up being over there for four months straight. Oh my God. So I ended up never going home, moved out of my brand new home, had to have my baby taken care of by my parents and my in-laws. They moved into our house and I ended up moving into the Ronald McDonald house and living there for four months. And before we could even get home the next following year, because it was right towards the end of the year. So we spent Christmas and New Year's in the uh, visa in the ICU uh, and got home the next year. And we thought everything, you know, we, we got her home and stuff. But she was unfortunate. She was bedridden. We were trying to get her help. But I had to basically every week she had to go to dialysis three times a week yeah, and go to radiation the other two days. It engulfs your life. Oh, I mean, man, that was it. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, and I tell people this and stuff and I, I realize that during this time, I, you know, real estate, that which was up here before, became way down here. That's what I was going to ask without appearing callous, because human life is a thousand times more important, you know, than, than our business. How did that affect your business and how did oh, you navigate that? You know, it's um, it, it, it was tough. I mean, it was you know, the, the biggest blessing I had was I did have some people helping me a little bit, but also another thing is I had built up some properties that were became cash flow properties mm -hmm. and it allowed me to keep afloat during that time. And then, you know, we, we, while my wife was home, we were getting her care. And then we went back in for a, another exam uh, to check in on the progress and make sure that, you know, no problem with the tumor or anything like that, that they removed. And this was within a few months after being home. And I remember getting, you know, going there for that scan and we found out that the cancer had reoccurred and, and the doctor told us that it was in every place really. And that I needed to call in hospice. Oh. And, uh, and that's, that's what we had to do. And uh, 10 months after my little baby boy uh, was born, my uh, first wife, Jennifer passed away. Oh, and, uh, I'm so sorry to hear Jerry. Uh, Thank you, Dan. It's, um, you know, and, and I share this with people. I think, Dan, uh, one, a couple of reasons I share this is, number one, I think it's important for them to understand that, you know, er, sometimes people put us on pedestals. Mm -hmm. You know how that goes. And they think oh, everything worked out. Guys, don't don't ever think that because things can change just like that. And that's exactly what happened to me. And I was in a position where I had to figure out how to restart my whole life over again because she worked with me in the business. She obviously we dated in high school and all this. And it was just, it was unbelievable. And so I had to rebuild everything over again. 
And it took me about two years to po a point, Dan, where I really got functioning again in my life. I, I did remarry my wife now, Joyce, and, um, you know, and we built a family together. Um, and uh, I moved over to the Dayton area and then a little town called Germantown, Ohio. And that's where I live now. But, you know, over the, that time, it was tough. And, you know, I I did get back and in, heavily into the business, but it took me a couple of years to get back functioning again. Yeah. So, so for, first of all, thank you so much for being candid and opening up about uh, something that I imagine uh, can cannot be easy. It it must bring pain, you know, to uh, for you to think about those things. So, for you to feel um, okay opening up about it, uh, thank you so much, you know, for for doing that. But that really allows a lot of people to connect because life is is not you know a nice easy up uh you know going up and we're fine there are a lot of of peaks and valleys so i'd like for you to go back to the days in which you were able to pick yourself back up mentally if you don't mind yeah. and maybe share some you know words of wisdom that can help someone who may be in a very dark situation right now. They know how to do the business. Maybe they've already been doing it, but either emotionally or financially or marriage wise or, or, you know, COVID-19 or a death in the family. They're just in a very low place emotionally. What helped you kind of pick yourself up from that situation? Well, you know, a big thing on it, number one, is make sure you share with others what's going on. And in regards to, you know, tell them what you're going through. But in the same time, make sure that, you know, and I'm, look, I've always been a believer too in, the, in my faith. And that was a big portion of things too, bro. Okay. Has to. So, but then also I believe very strong. And one of the things I went through was um, rewiring my thinking. And what I mean by that on um, things, Dan, I made a commitment to just go in and make sure the input coming in was what I wanted. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because during that time, obviously you're in a very fragile position on things. So you got to make sure the input coming in is really critical. So if you think about any of the listeners, or like you said, are going through this dark time, make sure you're focusing on, you know, and controlling what your input is and also controlling very carefully that circle of influence that you have around you. Because right now you're in a sensitive, sensitive time. And, you know, you, 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 know, you know, both of us have heard this many times and a lot of listeners probably here too. You know, the, those people that you spend the most time with is who you become. And yeah. it is so true. So I, I, I had to really watch that side of things because a lot of, you know, during that time, I was in a position where a lot of people were like, hey, Jerry, let's best thing to do is just go out and drink it and, and have drinks and and mm. work all this out and stuff. And you have to realize that you have to be really careful in this. And it, it's a point where you have to make a decision. And I, I'll tell you, you know, the, the, the movie line that we all know here uh, from a very famous movie is one I always go back to. And that yeah, is, what is get it? busy living or get busy dying, right? Oh, Shawshank Redemption. Yeah. And that is so true. And I, and it's like, you have to focus on that side of things. So that's what I did. And I've done that for my kids. I, and, and you always got to look at, it goes back to your why. So I think anybody on here, you got to constantly look, remind yourself, what is that? Why feed your mind with the right stuff. And then the last item I really look at is you got to become very focused and, and start taking massive action towards those items. Because if you don't get focused, you know how that goes, Dan, both of us do that. You can get pulled in so many different directions on the side of things. And that's what I had to do. So when I got remarried my, uh, and you know, even to the before that point, you know, I was trying to just get function again, but I, I got to the point where I started getting focused again, uh, you know, maintaining your health, doing some type of exercise and things like that. And that's what will help you. 
And a lot of people will think, well, well, I thought we were talking real estate. Well, without this, you're not going to have the real estate opportunities. And that's what you got to yeah. look at on things. So that's what else you're really driving towards. And I started building the whole machine back up. And um, and we were able to grow it to a whole nother level. Yeah, so, no, no, no. That's that's super, super powerful. I really like you know how you how you highlighted the fact that you really have to be careful what you're putting in your mind and what you allow to have access to you. And I'm sure that wasn't just uh, just people. It, it was news media. It, it was oh, what you were reading. It was your books. It, it was your neighbors. You know, all of that. It's like what's entering in you. Yeah, I mean, think about this too, Dan. A lot of people don't realize the timing when she passed. Within just a few months, 9-11 happened. Oh, yeah. Okay. So you talking about, uh, so not only, but that also affected the business side of things. Okay, mm -hmm. too. Because that was another hit on that side. A lot of people that weren't around in the business at that time don't realize what, what that done. Because it literally froze everything. You know, we weren't. We Nothing were, happened for three yeah, months. Really? Nothing. Yeah, everything just boom ceased. So um, that was a lot, and I, I you know, and, and I, I have to say this: during that time, I'm really glad that actually social media and stuff didn't exist during that time, <laughs> because I think, I it would, see I why. think the negativity would have been on a whole nother level. I don't know how the kids handle things today. I mean, they don't. Uh, that's that's really what it comes down to. Just being bombarded with so much negative social media. Um, hey, listen, Jerry, I want to take one quick pause. If you guys are finding value in being able to connect with somebody like Jerry, um, do me a favor. Go ahead and hit the share button. And let's go ahead and send this feed to those in your own social media walls. It's not often that we're able to hear the story of how someone uh, came from nothing lost a lot of it, if not all, certainly emotionally, you know, and have slowly picked themselves up. And if you guys find value in this, please, please, let's, let's share this, share this with the world. So now help me understand, Jerry, um, after 9-11, obviously very dark, you know, time, uh, your baby was born, which is very happy, but you lost your wife. So sorry about that. And your business suffered. And then 9-11, and then what, where do you, where do you go from that? What's going on in your mind? How do you pick yourself up from that? Oh, wow. That was, um, you know, I, the, like say the biggest thing was just trying to keep my mind, uh, really that all came down to trying to keep my mind right and my spirit right. And it was, it was, a, it was a daily uh, process. So Exercise. a lot of people, you know, and I think that's important. Anybody in here that's listening to this today, right? You know, like say live or record. Remember, this is a daily process, and you're going to go through. You know, all of us are going to go through different things like that. But you just got to constantly work through it on a daily basis, and that's exactly what I did. And I was able to, like, say, get uh, remarried, and um, and I started focus on really building the business up heavy again. And I, the, the thing is that another big situation happened to Dan after oh, no. that. I, I went, I, I built the business up. I ended up doing, uh, I built a pretty good rehab machine, had four full-time project managers working for me and just a lot of stuff going on. Okay. And over in the Dayton area and stuff. And then uh, one, uh, they say I came to the point where I realized something. Then I said, man, I built this massive machine up. And I said, I hate it. <laughs> I hate it. Wow. I didn't, what did you I, hate most about it? What was going on? When, when I hated was what I created was uh, a machine that was 100% dependent on me. That's true. So it was. And like, you knew firsthand that you might not be there at any moment. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, wait a minute. So I built this machine up all about Jerry and. What I learned so much on this side of things is that what I really learned a lot about was people and mm. in uh, bringing on team members and how hiring people strictly based upon their skills is a big mistake. Mm. Say that again. Hiring, hiring 
people strictly based upon their skills is a big mistake. Wow, that's powerful. That's powerful. Tell us why. Share why. Well, the reason behind that is what we don't look at. It, it really, it, it comes down to this. What, it, it comes down to what you're not hiring them for in, in those situations is you're not looking at, do they fit your culture? And do you understand? And also your driving force to the business is what we call core values. And what's funny is I get a lot of people say, you know, and there might be listeners on here. Well, it's just me starting up and maybe uh, somebody helping you part time or something like that or a spouse even. Um, the thing you don't realize is regardless of where you're at, you have a culture in your business. You do. And it's it's like if you think about a parking lot. A parking lot not maintained will grow weeds. True. No matter what. OK. Yeah. So weeds find a way. Yeah. And so do, <laughs> so do bad cultures. Mm -hmm. So you can, you, so the thing you, everybody's got to realize you have a culture re regardless if you believe it or not. Okay. And it doesn't matter where you're at on things. If you're just two people, if you're a hundred people. So I had to learn from that and I had to really dig in on that because it got me to the point where, I had to make a big decision and my big decision was I pretty well had to clean out my team and mm. remove almost 75% of the team. You had to take the weeds out of the parking lot. I had to take the weeds out of the parking lot. And, it, and what Dan wanted And that. it's not your fault. They were weeds. So, but yeah, you're the one it, who had to do it. Yeah. And it's, but I, I realized that it was my fault that I let them stay there. Mm. And so it's, you know, if you look at it, the problems are always at the top and, that's me. And I was in, in that position. So I, and I think what, what really got my clarity on this was one day I was looking at this and reassessing all this. And I said, wait a minute, I'm, I'm in the, I'm in the real estate business, but am I really in the business or am I in real estate just itself? And I want you to think about this. Okay. Most people will never think of it this way is I drew a line down a center piece of paper and then on one side of the paper, I wrote real estate. The other side, I wrote business. And what I realized was something I was doing, and I started seeing this too in students that I've worked with over the years, that most people spend their entire career in real estate. And what that means is they're so ingrained in that that they never get a chance to see it on a level where it can be a true company. They're over Got here focused. It. And I always look at it this way, Dan, is – that sometimes they'll spend their entire career being a deal chaser. Mm, mm -hmm. And it's no different than think about this. It's no different than being the, the local plumber. And there's nothing wrong with this if you want to do that. But the thing is that local plumber can go around and they never look at themselves as a business. They call themselves a business. But honestly, if they go away somewhere for two weeks, the income stops. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you have to start looking at that in a different way. And so I, when I drew that line down the centerpiece of paper and I wrote real estate on one side, business on the other, I started looking at the other side of it. I said, what's, what's the business? Well, business is about overall operating system. It's backed by processes, putting people in as you can grow. But the cool thing about when you set up a business properly, guess what? That business will grow. And then all you have to do is look at, and I started looking at real estate differently than real estate. I looked at it as nothing more than a product. Just like if I was in the business of, uh, you know, of cell phones or something like that, it's nothing more than a product. Mm -hmm. So I had started looking at it that way and it doesn't really matter what your exit strategy is. It could be wholesaling, it could be buy and hold, fix and flip. It doesn't really matter on that. We all have business has some type of product or service. And with the same thing with real estate. And when I started shifting that, that was a big change the way I looked at things and, and really changed my business going forward. Even through today, I look at things completely different because what I do is I focus on the business side of things. And then I learn that if I do that, other people can do all the things that I was involved with before. And you can actually scale because yeah. other than that, you can't scale. It's not a scaling process on things. Does that make sense? Yeah, I know 100%. You know, and I and I totally uh, I totally get that and I I, I want our audience to 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 get it. 
if you are in the business, if you are clocking in, if, if the signature depends on you, if the deal analysis depends on you, then you're not a business. Don't put your egos aside, you know, let's go ahead and, and take the pride down a little bit. Unfortunately, it's just you being very well paid. I mean, you, you can be a very well paid self-employed person, but you, you are just a very well paid, uh, job, you know, employee of, 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 of what you're doing. But when you get to the arena of how can I create an ecosystem that operates by my guidance, but the, the ins and outs and, and the trinkets and the movements and, and the widgets, they go on their own. That that's, that's when all of a sudden, you know, the business is a need you. And that's a beautiful feeling. That yeah. is a beautiful feeling because you know, unfortunately, like, like, you know, Jerry, life can change any moment and you might not be there to take Absolutely. care of that business. So what's going to happen to the families that are not dependent on you. But if you are responsible to them, you created a system that allows them to continue to get paid with or without your daily input. 100%. You know, and that, that, that is, that is, is, is phenomenal. Now, Let's, um, th this is massive gold. I, I, I super, super like it. I appreciate it. Let's hone it down and let's, let's bring it down to somebody who is listening to this podcast, this live Q and a, and they are wanting to learn how they can start the business of real estate investing. And maybe they've learned about wholesaling contracts, assignments, fix and flips, owner finance. Maybe they have a rental Maybe they have still a, a W-2 job and, um, you know, they're still kind of, uh, are you able to hear me? Yes. Yep. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I think we have some technical issues right now, but let's talk to that individual who is, who is barely starting out and is wanting to learn more. What, what advice would you give them? You know, I, I think one of the first things I would look at on, on things, Dan, is to, Realize that first of all, you got to get clarity of where are you really wanting to go on this business, and I, I think that's a big component of things because I see so many people come into this business. They start they start looking at it and they're like, okay, you know, hey, I'm going to go out, I'm going to make an extra hundred thousand dollars in this next year. But the, the really comes down to is what do you need to do to actually make that happen. And that, that's the big gap, I think, that so many people go out there and start studying. And in, in the educational side, too, I think that's a real lacking area is that people, they don't understand what journey, what that journey really looks like. And they have to understand what steps need to be in place to make that happen. Does that make sense, on Dan? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it really does. And I I, uh, I, I I get it. You know, what are the steps that are going to be taken, taken there from your perspective? You know, yeah. let's just kind of hear your side. What what would you uh, say to someone who's who's really just wanting to start out and say, listen, uh, maybe I got a little bit of money, you know, and, and let's just throw a number out there. Five thousand dollars that I can put into maybe marketing. I've, I've got some time, you know, that I can kind of set aside. How can I make best use of it? What would you say to them? Well, what I look at is I tell everybody I work with to start off with some of the core pillars to this business. And this the, my definition and what I look at on these pillars is. Number one, and this goes with, I think this is so powerful and things is, first of all, understand what do you need? Okay. That's the first question. First pillar on this. Well, I look what do you at, need? Okay. What do you need? And what I mean by that to answer that is, do you want cash now or do you want to build future wealth? Good question. Okay. Because find here's, goals. So one of the things, Dan, I see this all the time. People get involved in this business. What happens? They go, oh, you know, I saw this uh, training and stuff talks about buying rental properties, and all this. And they what they do is they go into the buying rental properties. And then next thing you know, they become this uh, complete slave to the rental properties. and They hate it. Right. And then they're not building any. Uh, they're, they're very little on cash and they're just strapped on cash and everything else. So it, that's like a third of our sellers. Yeah, yes, <laughs> absolutely. So what I uh, if you understand this question and you say, well, I really need. The cash now okay well then let's only focus on the strategies that are going to produce that okay mm. so that's top of the list then the second thing i look at on this is one of the second pillars i look at is get clear 
on what that revenue goal looks like and take it down to the point where it's just the next 12 months. Get clear on that. Let's Got say, it. Make, say you want to make it, uh, you're working full-time job. You want to make an extra hundred grand. Okay, cool. So you're looking at that chunk money coming in, right? And chunks. So now let's I'm get- taking clear. notes, Jerry. Yeah. So we get, so we jot that down and we get clear on that. So define that. Then the next step, what most people drop the ball and a lot of the gurus won't train people on this is how do you reverse engineer that? Mm. So the next pillar is reverse engineering that side of things. So you got to look at it and say, okay, well, if I'm going to do that, let's just say it's wholesaling and wholesaling and you want to get an average of 10 K per deal. That means we've got to complete actually 10 deals over the next 12 months. Okay. Now let's get clear on that. What do we need to do? What are the, uh, what we call our true numbers that would need to be in place for that? So we start understanding that like, like we understand, well, let's research maybe a marketing channel. Cause see, this is where Dan, I see so many new investors struggle and then it fizz out of the business because they don't understand the reverse engineering and they don't understand that they, they, they get sold into something where they say, Hey, just go out and put a bunch of uh, mail out and keep mail on the same list. But how do they know that list is even working? Okay, so you got to get clear on that. Then we can start saying, okay, well, that's the case. This is what we're looking at, hopefully, uh, that we're shooting for on an average response rate. We'll have to test these numbers where we're starting here. And then we were able to get those numbers clear. And then we can go in and position where we can start pushing out certain uh, levels of, you know, uh, marketing going on based upon our budget. And then what happens on that is now we have actually something measurable to go off of dan okay i like that i like yeah. that so 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 we're going to start off with you need clarity on what it is that you want transactional or cash flow exactly pillar number two pillar number two clear goal for the next 12 months pillar number three reverse engineer it reverse engineering and breaking it down as it. much I love level that. as you can the more you can break it down the better it's going to be on the clarity piece Okay. How, how many phone calls do I need to make? Exactly. How many minutes do I need to be on the phone? How many mailers do I need to send out to start well, well, X amount of, how many conversations, how many contracts? How, what's, what's my closing ratio on contract? If I get three signed, how many of those are going to, are, are actually going to fund? Absolutely. See, and that's what most new investors really lack. They don't understand what to do on a daily basis. I could and agree. Then the, and then the last pillar I look at, is actually putting in tracking to measure those reverse engineering metrics you have to do. And it and it literally, we create this down to the point where we, and I've done this for a lot of students, we just create a daily KPI tracker. Daily. Real simple spreadsheet, a Google sheet. This comes down to this. And then next thing you know, we're tracking that to make sure that we're hitting these daily metrics. because. Dan, the big thing that you know, as you know, too, I think what uh, so many investors get, are guilty of what they do, they get focused on the wrong thing. They're like, oh, I got to get my CRM working. I got to get this. I going. know you don't. Right? <laughs> Dude. You need to pick up the damn phone. That's what you yeah, need to do. It's like, get a, some paper, get a pen and start working this. Okay. And that's and get on the phone. So you got to look at that. So what happens is when you put that down to the point, even if you're a solopreneur, even if you're just starting, you got to track your daily activity. And the key to this, get and I want everybody to pay attention to this. Your key is to stay somewhere in the neighborhood of 80% plus completion of your activity that's going to move you towards your goal. Because what happens is it takes you away from worrying about the goal and you focus on the activity. And if you're at 80% plus, you will hit your goals. You're checking mark, your check mark, your check, you're checking off those boxes. 100% dude. Make 100%. the boxes, check them off, check them off, yeah. check them off. And then you're, okay. you're no focused on whether or not, you know, the harvest will come. You're just, you're just planting. That's all you're doing. Yeah. And if oh, you do man. that over and over again, Dan, you know what's going to happen? You're going to say, boom, I just got my first deal. The next thing you know, you're starting to click a deal a month. And then, you know what? You're moving right towards that uh, revenue goal. And then as soon as you learn that, here's the cool thing about it. Now, get this. While you're doing that, document that journey. Mm -hmm. 
Because if you document that journey, now you just created a process for a small business. And you can bring in a new hire and say, exactly. hey, listen, this is the roadmap. Just go ahead and follow it. 100%. Don't deviate. Take somebody that's a brand new newbie. Very nice. Or somebody that's even, I've, I've worked with investors that are more seasoned. They, they just been always been scattered. I'm like, let's get, let's get focused here, man. And let's, let's build this into a, a business. So, you know, I get off, I, a lot of people ask me, you know, what would you have done differently when you first started this business? If you go back to the young Jerry in the twenties and that, I, that was a couple of years ago. I mean, that, yeah, that, that was a couple of years ago. ago. Yeah. So now you're calling me old, Dan. <laughs> Uh, oh, um, but I was telling him, I said, look, the, one of the first things I, 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 you know, I could go back and check myself. I would, the first day out of the gate, I would have said, create a business. Create start a business. focusing on this as a business. Because yeah. if you do that, what happens on it, you're going to start applying what I just talked about. And in 12 months, you'll be so much further along than some people that have been doing it for five years or more. I love it. I love it. So, so now let's talk about someone who perhaps um, is what I like to call a solopreneur. They've done okay. a few deals. They, they, they understand the mechanics. Uh, they have a little bit of understanding as to uh, what needs to be done A, B, C to get X, Y, Z. Um, what would you suggest that they do in their next step to really solidify it as a business and solidify it as a system? What are some of the key components that you would recommend based upon your experience that it's like, okay, you're doing it. Good. Thumbs up. You're, you're generating revenue. Good. You know, the activities good. You're probably not documented. You're probably not, um, you know, the, the clarity might not be hundred percent there. You, you, you have your gut, you kind of know what to do, but you don't know exactly how to speak about that. What would be the next step for somebody who's maybe in that phase and really wants to start creating, a, a business representation of what they're doing. Uh, yeah, no, I'd love that. And I get, we get a lot of clients I work with and our trainings that are in that position. And one of the things I always have them do, and a lot of people uh, don't understand this at first, but it's, it's crazy, but I have them actually do an accountability chart of all the moving parts within the organization. Accountability now, chart. Yeah. Because here's the thing you have to realize, Dan, is that no matter what, you, it doesn't matter what you're doing in a business, buy and hold, fix, flip, like say lease options. It, none of that matters. What you have to Are you saying that John Jackson doesn't matter? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> so actually I have him on. He's a, he's a cool um, cat. <laughs> yeah. He's good. I was just talking to him earlier today. So what, why um, does, why does his name always end up coming up in all of our live Q and A's? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Usually I see it on most wanted show. <laughs> oh man. Uh, Somebody tagged John Jackson on this. <laughs> we, we're uh, what are we minute uh, tag, tag him on minute, like 47 or something. <laughs> um, anyways, back to serious topics. Yeah. Yeah. That, look, um, I, I, you know, I just have people lay that out because what, I think one of the biggest mistakes most people uh, have in a, especially a small business, solopreneur uh, business like that, is what they do is, is they don't realize really what all the moving parts are. They just get so used to movement, put them wearing all the hats. They don't really get the clarity on that. So the best thing to do is just lay it all out. So we just lay out boxes. Here's a accountability chart. Oh, I got, wait a minute, I got marketing. Wait a minute, I got lead intake. I got acquisitions. I got transaction coordinating. You know, uh, if I'm a wholesale business, I get some type of dispo or, or if I'm flipping, I get some type of disposition going on. Oh, wait a minute. I got bookkeeping. You lay all this out and then you realize and you start writing in what all boxes are you in? Most of the time in the beginning, you're in majority of those boxes. But yeah. getting that clarity, what happens on that? And I tell people, I said, literally lay it out on some basically construction paper or whatever. Put it on your wall. Get the clarity on that and then start figuring out like this is the area I dislike the most. And then let's start working towards a goal to remove myself from this and put a date on that. Mm -hmm. And then we just start doing that, dude. Okay. You start then, firing yourself. Yeah, you start firing yourself, but you got to have a visual on that. Otherwise, wow. what happens, you're just yeah. spinning out there. And, and that's that was a big major improvement for me because 
I never really thought of, of the business that way. I, I was you, just, you do realize I'm just going to make this live Q&A and edit it and just say, hey, listen, just go to minute 45. <laughs> Nothing else matters. That, that, at least to me, Jerry, thank you so much for sharing that. Putting uh, on, on, on the wall, on, on a sheet of paper, all, all of the little departments that your business has and which ones you're in. And, and and you might not be in all of them, you know, you're not in legal, you know, you're not in title closing, you're not, you know, in a right. lot of other aspects, but which ones you're in and slowly start firing yourself from each one of them. Yep. And what I want to talk about on Dan on this is it ties into something that I look at as this business. We have four phases to this business. Well, first one is the launch phase. We're just getting going, right? Mm -hmm. The newbie, you're just getting chugging along. After we get chugging along a little bit, then we go into the growth phase. The growth phase is a phase where we start putting in some of the systems, start putting in some processes that we have, and we might even make a hire or two. Mm. And we're now we're starting to grow, right? We're starting to get things rolling, activity more, and things like that. Then, so that's the second phase. Now, I'm going to skip over the third phase, and I'll come back to that in just a minute. But then what happens typically in the growth phase, Dan, is this is where I see a lot of investors make mistakes. They go in, they say, you know what? It's time to scale this. So they go right to the fourth phase, which is the scale phase, and they push all uh, their energy into the scale phase. Then in a very short period of time, typically anywhere from six months to two years, everything comes back in their lap. Mm. And then you start making the collapse. You start making the comments like, "This is easier to do it myself. Forget all this, mm. right?" I mean, how many times have you been there? Yeah. yeah. So what happens is the reason that happened is because you skipped the third phase, and that is called the constraint phase. Constraint. And, and what you have to realize, and this goes back to that visual and that accountability chart and stuff like this. You have to understand where your unique abilities are and where you're, you, you, you know, where, where you suck at too. Yeah. And you have to go in and you start putting in constraints on this. Now constraints, it's funny on this. So a quick example is this. Most investors come in, what they do is they have leads coming into their pipeline. They bring the deal in and then they try to figure out what to do with the deal after they get it in the, in the pipeline. Like maybe I can buy and hold this, maybe I fix and flip it, maybe I'll wholesale it, whatever it is. The problem with that model, it's really tough to scale that. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's like any other business that you're in. If you have multiple highways to go on, which one do you go on? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what we look at is putting constraints on where maybe you have one or two. And I um, I like to refer to them as production lines. Think production of Production lines. Line. Yeah. Okay. Imagine if I was running uh, Toyota Camrys down an assembly line. That was my business. And then all of a sudden, I stopped the assembly line one day. And I said, right in the middle of the assembly line, I want to start doing Toyota trucks. Mm. What does that do to my team? What does it do to the production process? Everything. Throws everything off. But see, real estate investors do this every day. They bring a deal and they go, oh, I'm going to rehab this one. Nah, I'm going to wholesale this one. Nah, I'm going to rent this one. It makes you feel good. That you can do it all, but it wrecks your system. It wrecks your system, and Dan, it's never scalable. Yeah, that's true. Okay, 100%. so what you have to do is get clear on that. And what we do is we put constraints on that. Well, so we teach our students and stuff. Okay, put constraints on. So basically, over the next twelve months, we're only going to do three rehabs, this many wholesales, and then we lay that out. Because see, once you get clarity on that, guess what? It takes you out of the decision-making process on every deal and then eliminates, eliminates something that most business uh, owners suffer from. And that is called decision fatigue. Mm. I hate making decisions. <laughs> Dude, my my wife that. doesn't get this. And I, yeah. I know this is totally off topic, but it's kind of really related. I, I would dress the same exact way every day. I really would, you know, put on a shirt if there's a meeting, we'll put on a blazer. If there isn't, we'll take it off. You know, that's it. And my wife, she's like, oh, my God. No, you you wore that yesterday. Uh, why are you going to wear it again? And I'm like, well, I have another one. Why not? 
you know, and decision fatigue. It's such, I, I read a while back that there is a calorie burn rate associated with making decisions. <laughs> I don't doubt it at all. <laughs> and, and this is probably the worst part. It almost doesn't matter the decision you're making, what, whether it's it's a it's a decision that will affect your business for months or what are you going to eat today or what shoes are you going to wear. It almost doesn't matter the decision. The calorie burn rate will be almost similar or identical. Yeah, it's amazing. So the goal is to simply stop making decisions so that you can preserve those calories for the big important things of the day. Yep. And oh, it, man. So yeah. as you put the constraints on your business, what happens on that, you have to make fewer decisions. And that allows you to actually be in the position where you can start looking at the 10,000 foot view of your small business. Doesn't matter the size of it. And then it allows you to really start focusing on the growth side of things instead of being constantly in the grind. Okay. And it's an amazing what will happen on this. And you start putting constraints in too, like margins on your deal. You know, this is a certain margin. If it doesn't make that margin, I don't do the deal. Mm. Okay. People, and then it's, it, it really, it's, it really was a game changer for me in the business. And I never thought of. Where did you, before. where did you learn that? Cause you're a very smart guy, Jerry, but I can't give you credit for that. <laughs> <laughs> I actually got that from a buddy of mine. Yeah. That's built up over over 50 companies. Wow. And that's how he manages those companies. It's kind of along the lines of, I'm sure a lot of viewers are here and probably yourself have seen the show, The Prophet with yeah. Marcus Lemonis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. It's similar to that type of thinking. Okay. And you got to put that in place. Otherwise, what happens is just you just go across the board and it never becomes a real system mm -hmm. that can be actually applied in scale. The cool thing about it, once you do that, you start putting these constraints on. Then as you grow, you can start putting constraints on yourself, Dan, too. It's like, OK, you know, I don't need to be involved in this meeting or you're looking mm -hmm. at that kind of building chart and say, you know, what? I no longer need to do this. It's time to have somebody come in and sales. I train them on sales. Now they can have a, a system they can follow on that side of thing, and it's constantly. So you, the more constraints you put on yourself and your business, actually, the more it will grow. Wow. The more constraints you put on your business, the more it will grow. I, I, I have a feeling that that is the backbone behind the phrase, the riches are in the niches. I mean, that's yeah. a common phrase we all use, yeah. but uh, I, at least I, I can I can humbly say I, I didn't really know why. I, I know it's true and and I've made it part of you know my business when it came to real estate investing. I'm like, no, I like owner finance. This is what I'm going to be good at. I'm going to be good at buying on terms and I'm going to be good on selling on terms. And this is my niche. But I, I never really knew the science behind it. Thank you for sharing that constraints in your business is what allows you to grow your business. Wow. Wow. Yep. Listen, Jerry, I, I know that you are a super, super busy man. I, I asked for about 45 minutes of your time. I know we've gone over your time. I think I'm going to have to just send you a check for, for your generosity. <laughs> um, but you're good, dude. You're good. Thank you so much for, for, for being here and, and sharing. I don't know about you guys, but I took out of this that mm -hmm. I need to work on constraints. Cool. I absolutely need to work on on constraints. So listen, if people want to get in contact with you, um, whether to do business or, or whether to learn more a little bit about you, I know we have your email address at the bottom of the screen. But is there any other way that um, someone can can kind of reach out to you? Yeah, well, one, they can follow me on social media. Uh, Instagram is the Jerry Green. OK, it's pretty simple on that. You go to Facebook. Uh, just look up Jerry Green on the Facebook side of things in uh, Germantown, Ohio. You can connect with me there, either my business page or personal page, either one. Uh, so that's another area. And then a um, couple websites you can go to. Number one is uh, the, the jerrygreen.com. Okay. Okay. That's pretty simple on things. Talks a little bit. I uh, have some free videos in there, take you to some things there, and also some different programs I have. And um, also, um, you can check out, too, uh, the REI Sales Academy here. Nice, okay. nice. Yeah. REISalesacademy.com? Yep, REISalesacademy.com. Okay. And what we do there is we train you how to become 
a real ninja at com, uh, one, converting more deals, uh, converting more of your leads and making bigger spreads on those. Nice, so. nice, 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 nice. Well, again, thank you so much, Jerry, for being here. Guys, please follow Jerry, whether it's on Facebook or Instagram. Look him up online. Um, he's a gentleman that I recently met at a convention in Florida. But man, ever since that time, I'm like, man, Jerry, he's a cool cat. He's a giver. Um, we've been wanting to to bring you on board to to the show. And uh, it took us a couple of, of months to do that. I think I dropped the ball the first time. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm so happy, so happy that, that, that you're here. Um, thank you so much, Jerry, for being here. Any last words that you want to share? I'll leave the platform with you so that you can provide some nice, encouraging, concluding remarks. Big thing I would say is, Dan, just all the listeners out there, just guys, d d whatever you do, don't delay. Make it happen. Um, a great, uh, I always go by a little quote, and, and that is Eat That Frog. And that's a book by Brian Tracy, great little read that talks about bite the head off the frog first thing in the morning to do that thing that scares you the most. And that's where you're going to get this rolling, baby. Oh, man, I love it. Guys, thank you so much. You guys have a great one. Thank you so much, Jerry. You guys enjoy your day. Take care. We'll see y'all. Have a great one. See you, my man. Bye-bye.